This is a podcast from the South China Morning Post. So when you mention the word decouple, it's, uh, it's an interesting word. So we lose billions of dollars, and if we didn't do business with them, we wouldn't lose billions of dollars. It's called decoupling, so you'll start thinking about it. It's called decoupling. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the US-China Trade War Update with me, Finbar Birmingham, on the Political Economy Desk at the South China Morning Post. US election season is heading into the finishing straight and unsurprisingly China is at the centre of both campaigns. Joe Biden this week released his plans to bring manufacturing jobs out of China and back to the United States. Companies who offshore jobs to China to sell stuff back to the US will face higher taxes. It's quite a similar policy to the one that Trump unveiled a few weeks ago. In fact, Biden's strategy on China is, in the minds of many, beginning to look veritably Trumpian. But whereas that may fly well in Washington these days, it's not going down too well with American firms in China who have told us that they're fed up of all this talk of decoupling. They just want to be left alone. We don't think there's much chance of that happening over the next few years, but even though political pressure to get out of China is rising, more than 90% of respondents to an American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai survey this week, they said they plan to stay. Business arguably doesn't have the seat at the table in the White House it once did, and this is being set up for a fascinating collision. You'll hear more about that on this week's podcast. Meanwhile, China's charm offensive on the European Union continues apace as it seeks to maintain at least part of one foot in the global order. Xi Jinping will speak with Angela Merkel and the top EU officials next week in a bid to salvage a bilateral investment treaty that has dragged its heels for years. Can the Europeans get something out of China that Trump wasn't able to? And in the week that Disney's Mulan felt the force of the online groundswell of opposition to China's treatment of Uyghur people in Xinjiang, the US is mulling a ban on cotton products made in China's westerly region, allegedly using forced labour. Xinjiang has gone from an unknown issue among US voters very recently to a core issue on the campaign trail. How is this viewed in Beijing? which has frankly loved the fact that over two years of negotiations, Trump's team kept trade and human rights on two separate tracks. Find out as I chat with our political economy editors, John Carter and Joe Shin on this week's show. It's called decoupling, so you'll start thinking about it. You'll start thinking. They take our money and they spend it on building airplanes and building ships and building rockets and missiles. They hope that uh, Joe Biden becomes president. If Joe Biden becomes president, China will own the United States and every other country will be smiling. Delighted to be joined, as usual, by our political economy editors here, John Carter, Joe Shin. You just heard from Donald Trump. He is on the campaign trail and he is talking about decoupling. It's really become a hot topic over the last couple of years. And this week we saw Joe Biden, his challenger, also release a policy plan which would try and encourage American companies to leave China, bring manufacturing back home to the United States. We also saw a really interesting survey come out this week. The American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai had its annual survey of members, which showed that only 4% of their members are thinking of moving manufacturing back to the United States, despite Trump's orders to get out of China. 92% do not plan to leave China totally, while 70.6% do not plan any changes to their production base. It shows that a third are planning some sort of move, at least in part, uh, with Southeast Asia the top destination, but there is a disconnect here. John Carter, Joe Shin, what does this tell us about the decoupling debate, which is gathering pace and which is getting a lot of column inches, but which is maybe not resonating through this part, at least, of the business community in China? Well, first of all, it, it these these are companies in this survey who have been in China for a long time. They have... They're dug in. They have a large installed bases, and and they're making good profits in China, and so they don't want to leave. Uh, I would point out a story today that uh, Tesla and uh, GM's joint venture are the two largest selling electric vehicles in China, and these sales in China are helping both companies' bottom lines, 
um, where the U.S. market for both of them are is hurting because of the pandemic. Hmm. So this is part of the disconnect that you talk about is that on the one hand, uh, the U.S. government is trying to get these companies to come home. On the other hand, these companies can't afford to do that because they're making so much of a profit in China. Yeah, and I think it's worth pointing out that the survey did say that 55% of these uh, companies as well, they are making in China for China. They're not exporting back to the United States. So even incentives such as what Joe Biden announced this week, where he would tax firms who offshore jobs to China and other countries only with the view to selling them back to the US consumer, um, that maybe wouldn't be that much of a, of a stick for these companies because as we just said, they're, they're making in China for China. Zhou Xin, the Chinese government obviously would not want to see all of these companies leaving. Um, the decoupling debate, has it unsettled policymakers in Beijing? Is, is this something that you think is a conscious focus for them uh, day in, day out? Okay, yes. Um, I think, Bob, because of this decoupling has been you know, going going on for several months, even during trade war, there are lots of decoupling uh, talks. And at a press conference in Washington back in January, after signing of the phase one trade deal, Liu He said, you know, this idea is impossible because Chinese and the U.S. economy are so integrated, it's impossible to decouple now. But however, uh, at the same time, um, at the corona, when, the, when the coronavirus happened, China did uh, worry a lot about uh, it's losing its relevance in the global value chains. Uh, however, what happened in the last last you know two or three months because China is the first in and the first out of the coronavirus, China has gained like fresh confidence. China's role in the global manufacturing has actually increased because other countries are still in deep trouble, and China was uh, you know the first to resume production and manufacturing. So China's share of the global exports market is actually increasing. And together with China's huge market, as you just said, you know, many businesses there are uh, in China, for China. So uh, China is not really as worried as maybe, you know, in the, in the beginning of 2020 mm-hmm. about the decoupling uh, threats. Of course, it's still uh, on the agenda of Beijing. You can see, uh, you know, uh, president, from President Xi Jinping to vice premiers to uh, ministers, they are trying very hard to talk sweet uh, to U.S. businesses and the European mm-hmm. businesses, saying, you know, no matter what happened, our market will be open and wider. You know, also Beijing is very selective and very restrained, I say, in uh, retaliation against any uh, U.S. measures like against the Chinese companies. You know, China is not targeting many U.S. businesses uh, uh, in response to these uh, Washington measures. So this, you, you can see this kind of uh, the strategy is still going on uh, in Beijing. And there's another angle, Finbar, to this, which is the dependence of the U.S. on a lot of things that are made in China. We wrote a story that ran yesterday about the dependence of the U.S. for medicines, either the medicines themselves or the chemicals that are used to make them, most of which are made in China. And even India, which is the second largest exporters of medicines to the U.S., depends on the chemicals made in China. And so one of the things that the U.S. would like to do would be to reduce, if not end, this dependence. But that's a huge task that will take years of investment and work by U.S. companies and the U.S. government. Mm. This is something that we were, uh, I've been reporting on, and there's a story we're going to run next week um, about where the various, the the, the two candidates for the the presidency, you know, their their decoupling strategies and where they fit in, etc. And the general consensus is that the U.S. will push strongly to bring, uh, even under Biden, to bring stuff like medical and uh, critical drug supply chains back to the U.S. But I think that there is some uh, realistic thinking, at least in the Biden camp, that they know that you can't bring a lot of this manufacturing back to the U.S. And this is where this coalition of allies comes in. So if Biden was to be elected, he would build bridges and alliances with the European Union, with various Asian partners, Australia, uh, Japan, South Korea, and so on, to maybe try and reduce their reliance on Chinese goods as a as a coalition. Um, Joe Shin, do you think that there's a lot of debate these days about who does China want to win the election, Trump or Biden? And regardless of that, one of the talking points has been that this coalition of allies would be something Beijing would be worried about because it would sort of be a strength in numbers and and, and so on. What's your what's your thoughts on that? Uh, yes, Fingba. Because that's the, that would be the worst scenario for Beijing if the U.S. can work with Europe, Japan, South Korea, Australia, uh, Southeast Asia, 
to isolate China from the global value chains, <laughs> of course, that's uh, certainly Beijing doesn't want to happen uh, because that's why uh, you see you know, China is making so much efforts to win the favor of uh, uh, European Union. You can see Wang Yi is touring, Wang Yi and Yang Jiechi are two top Chinese diplomats uh, are touring uh, uh, Europe. And then uh, Vice Premier Liu He, the most trusted economic advisor for President Xi, has conducted a meeting with European counterparts uh, yesterday. And the next Monday, uh, she will talk with Marco and also the European Union leaders to, I think Beijing will offer something. You know, uh, if Trump is pursuing, whether Trump or Biden wins the presidency, China will continue to open to open its market to, 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 to European companies. And this is kind of something, uh, you know, dangling in, in front of uh, Brussels. And for uh, Southeast Asia and uh, even for South Korea and Japan, and China is also doing its work. You can see that, you know, um, one of the closest uh, economies China is trying to uh, build relations with South Korea. Um, even when coronavirus was at its peak, China has already provided some uh, travel bubbles for Korean business delegates. For instance, as early as in April, I think, China allowed a bunch of uh, uh, Korean engineers to come into the site in Xi'an for, their, uh, for the Samsung projects there. So, so you can see China is also trying on its way to 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 to, to counterbalance uh the approach by by washington so it's very interesting to see like mm -hmm. and also i think for many many markets it's very difficult to pick one side so for most of the markets for like southeast asia they don't want like falling to this uh two big power rivalry right that the two big guys are fighting the room and that we have nowhere to hide so they want to take advantage of both sides so mm -hmm. it's very interesting to see how this will how this will happen. Yeah, that's yeah. that's really very interesting. It would be interesting to see what the what Beijing is willing to offer to the EU because the sense I've gotten from reporting over this in recent months is is whatever they offer to the EU, the US is going to look for it as well. Um, you know, so if they say there's some market access for the European Union firms, um, then that will have to be opened up to American firms. Otherwise. You know, <laughs> Lighthizer and Trump aren't going to be very happy. Um, John, do, do you get that sense that um, the United States will be watching this very closely and that there will be demand for reciprocity? Absolutely. I mean, the U.S. wants as much access to the Chinese market as it can get. And arguably, and this is controversial argument, arguably without uh, the trade war, then the progress we have seen recently might have not have taken place. In any case, the key issues for the EU in terms of the investment treaty are um, um, support for state-owned enterprises, uh, the subsidies that those um, enterprises get, and will China give enough ground on those issues in order to satisfy the EU? Mm -hmm. um, it's difficult to imagine that given how much support and re doubling down of support the uh, Beijing has given to state-owned enterprises recently. It's also difficult to imagine because um, they've had the Chinese have had so much opportunity in recent months and years in negotiating with the United States to give up some concessions, and they really haven't. So, well, no, why, would, why would this be different for, with the European Union? Is it just because of what Joe Shin said? They don't want to burn all the bridges, or? Well, I would think that that's part of it. Is that uh, they're feeling isolated? That they're feeling the pain of the U.S. sanctions and the U.S. trade war, and that they're hoping that the Europeans will side with them and give them a, a way to export or continue to export, and also give them um, support for multinationalism, a multilateral institutions which the U.S. is currently rejecting. Um, so they're looking to the EU for support in various ways uh, in opposition to the U.S. But uh, I would note that the EU investment treaty has been under negotiation for seven years. Yeah. And so, so we're here again today. Mm. What's going to be different tomorrow or on Monday, should I say, uh, than has been true seven of the last seven years? Uh, are we going to see significant movement? Remains to be seen. Mm. Yeah, the, but we 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 have to uh, you know bear in mind that the changes are often made when Beijing feels uh, external pressure. You know, if we, it doesn't feel any external pressure, you know why why bother to change? You know, but if uh, there are huge pressure from the United States or from Europeans saying, okay, if you don't make these changes, then there will be no way to continue the business as usual, and maybe this will create uh, uh, you know eternal pressure in mm -hmm. Beijing. You know, the reformists will say whether whether they do exist or not, at least the people in favor of these structure changes will say, okay, guys, we have to do something. 
Otherwise, yeah. you know, the consequences are just there. Yeah. What would be a, what do you think would be a acceptable concession that Beijing may be willing to offer? Uh, well, uh, for, first, first of all, uh, 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 at least on the paper, there were more sectors opened to uh, the European businesses. Uh, the, the European Chamber of Commerce is saying they have like more than 800 recommendations. I, I guess Beijing would take like 600, 600 of them and say, here, 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 you know, you can have all of these if you really want. Like if you really want to operate a port in China, okay, you can try try one. If you really want to have your lawyers in Beijing, you know, we can provide some offices for you. You can start to start to do your do your, do your business. These are these are quite uh, um, uh, possible. But of course, there are also uh, red lines. China, if European says, oh, you have to give up your whole state-owned sector, China will say no. But but what kind of business opportunities do you want? Right? You want a fair competition, or you want the subsidies? Maybe maybe you know if we can say uh, Beijing will launch a policy saying. If we have a, 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 a subsidiary, you know, no matter whether you're a foreign company or state-owned company, you can apply for that. So if you're a European uh, chip-making company, you set up a plant in China. If you want to go government subsidies, you can file the, file the paperwork to Beijing and possibly we'll get some money. Yeah. So these kind of offerings I can, I can imagine. But uh, in terms of the internet, for instance, if Europeans said, oh, you have to uh, dismantle the Great Firewall totally, and Beijing will say definitely will say no. But on the other hand, maybe there's some more, uh, for instance, Wang Yi, is, uh, Wang Yi and Liu He was talking about a lot of data transfer, right? There can be some uh, agreement between China and Europe in terms of uh, data, data protection and privacy. These kinds of things are ex expected. And, and do you think that there's realization, in, I mean, there must be aware, obviously, that whatever China concedes to the European Union, there's going to be vast pressure to open the same benefits up to the United States? Oh, yes. I think for China, the idea, the idea is saying is you treat everyone equally. Otherwise, you're just like looking at, uh, at like different uh, demanding parties. You know, you give this uh, you give this to Wang and the other one will say, ah, I wanted this as well. The, the, the best way is just to have uh, have a, a, a level level playing field for, for everyone so that there won't be any trouble. For instance, if in chemical sector, if uh, bus um, won't have a project there, and uh, I, I don't see the reason why Chinese government should have rejected a similar application from the, the United States. Yeah. So they won't offer anything that they're not already <laughs> prepared to, <laughs> give to, to give to the US, yeah. um, for sure. Um, we were also recording on Friday morning here. We thought that by this stage in the week, we would have something concrete to report on a US move to restrict um, the import of products made in, in Xinjiang, which was something we reported on Monday is in the works. Um, we understand it will come in the form of with, withhold release order, um, which will mean that products that come to the United States um, that have any suspicion of having used being made using forced labor in, in Xinjiang, the Xinjiang region of, of China will be turned away. They could be forced to be destroyed or re-exported. And this is likely to affect cotton and tomato-based products. One thing, guys, that has struck me in recent weeks and months is how central the Xinjiang issue has become to the to the US-China debate. And my sense, and perhaps John, you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, is that in the United States, I don't know that many people would have even heard of Xinjiang this time last year, but now it really seems to be one of the focal points of this um, this rivalry. It's become an election issue, yes. And there's growing movement to punish China for alleged human rights abuses. And um, we've had Senate bills that have um, uh, sought to punish um, uh, work in Xinjiang. And the, the human rights issues are, are creeping into uh, the trade area quite extensively, and we're seeing this more in Europe as well. Um, when uh, uh, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi was in Europe um, a couple of weeks ago, and he heard a lot about uh, human rights issues, um, and this may enter into the negotiations with Xi about um, the investment treaty. Uh, we don't know, but um, it is a much bigger issue than it was even several months ago. Hmm. The European Union has traditionally been, I'm going to say, stronger on human rights than the Trump administration. And Joe and I know from speaking to academics in China, this is something that they, the Chinese government generally wants to keep on a separate track to trade and commercial issues. And there is a sense that if the Democratic nominee 
Joe Biden wins the election in November, then human rights may become more central to discussions over trade and so on. Is that a concern in Beijing? Oh, yes. This is almost like going back to the old days, you know, when um, uh, when Clinton uh, was talking about giving the most favored nation status to China, they try to link it with human rights. And when finally the two trade and human rights are separated from China, see it as a, you know, a big relief. And also this also kind of paved the way for China's entry into WTO. So if you know trade is going to uh, blended with other topics, for instance, human rights, this will be a big trouble for China. And China certainly does not want this to happen. Yeah, we hopefully have more to discuss on this um, withhold release order, which would hit cotton next week. But just a, f- a few stats to illustrate the, the conversation. The US imported uh, $11.1 billion of uh, apparel products from China in well, in in 2019, which is 20 almost a quarter of its entire garment import, and 80 percent of um, cotton made in China comes from Xinjiang. So this would be a huge commercial deal for both the US and China. And the thinking is, from my sources in 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 Washington, that um, USTR, the US Trade Representative, the US Department of Agriculture, and the Treasury Department, and even the Customs and Border Protection Agency itself do not want this ban because they said it would a be a nightmare to administer and b it, it could really upend the phase one trade deal because um china buys a lot of u.s cotton um 844 45 million dollars in the first seven months of 2020 which is up 75 percent year on year so if the u.s bans chinese cotton then china you know has a fair chance that it might buy the ban U.S. cotton. Um, so this is a complicated issue that we may hear more about next week. But um, John, it's it's just another complication in what has become a real, absolute spider web tangled mess. No, indeed, and um, the the uh, Chinese purchase of his U.S. cotton are part of the uh, Phase One trade deal, and the reason they're up so much is China trying to comply with that deal. Now, if you ban um, uh, Chinese cotton and the Chinese will ban U.S. cotton. And does that mean that the phase one trade deal falls apart? It's very complicated. And that calculus may be one reason we haven't heard the announcement on the ban of Chinese cotton. Mm-hmm. But going forward, uh, it's it's the whole relationship is becoming extremely complicated and uh, a series of dominoes, if you will. And you knock over one domino and the whole other series of them fall. Domino Rally reminds me yes. of a game I used to play as a, as a kid. The um, the week behind us, we saw um, China's trade data, which was strong exports, as Joe Shin intimated, the Chinese share of global exports is increasing. Its export machine is powering forward. Imports are weaker. Um, what's on the agenda for next week, John? Any important economic data? On Tuesday, we get uh, the monthly series of data, industrial production, uh, retail sales, and fixed asset investment. Uh, We presume that industrial production will continue to uh, grow uh, at a moderate pace. The big issue will again be whether retail sales uh, return to growth or continue to decline. They've been down for six months in a row, going back to February uh, at at the height of the coronavirus pandemic. And so, um, uh, retail sales are consumer purchases of goods, which are our proxy for overall consumer pur- purchases. And given the Chinese government's new dual circulation strategy, which focuses on the domestic market, further and increased consumer spending is part of that, is a necessary part of that. And so uh, how the consumers are buying is an important question that uh, we will find out on Tuesday. Mm. Joe Shin, on the political side, I suppose we're waiting to see what comes of Xi Jinping's meeting with top European brass on Monday. Anything else in the pipeline? Well, China is entering its uh, um, really critical decision-making period because in October, in next month, uh, there's a big party gathering. And, you know, this one is going to uh, finalize China's strategy for the next five years and even some uh, broader guidelines uh, for the for the period to 2035. But it's still the debate about uh, China's new economic strategy to do uh, circulation uh, is still not ending in, in Beijing. And as you can see, as we reported, uh, you know, uh, Xi has gathered his uh, special strategic task force for economic policy uh, making for the third time this year. And to, you know, to uh, basically to build up and to cons- consolidate the consensus 
just to say everything we decided at the top must be implemented offensively. You have to be realized that China is entering an uh, unstable and uncertain period. The world is increasingly hostile and everything that has been decided at the top has to be uh, implemented properly on the ground. And from these kind of statements, you can see that it's uh, uh, the, the, the tension or, you know, the, um, as the anxiety in Beijing hasn't been totally gone away. So we are, it's going to be very interesting to see how uh, these kinds of political messages are going to be uh, delivered from state media from Beijing in the, in the coming weeks. We shall hear more about that in the coming weeks on the podcast. But for now, John Carter, Joe Shin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast. I've been Finbar Birmingham on the SCMP's Political Economy Desk. You can keep up with all our coverage of the China issues in the US election, on the US-China trade war, on the backlash against Xinjiang at scmp.com. You can follow our team on Twitter at SCMP Economy and I'm at F Birmingham. That's Birmingham spelt with a B-E-R, not like the city. Please take a moment to like, share and subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening. And if you're at a loose end, please do check out our Inside China podcast this week in which Mimi Lau takes a fantastic deep dive into all the issues surrounding Disney's Mulan. We'll be back next week. Stay safe, wash your hands, keep your distance, wear your mask. For more podcasts from the South China Morning Post, head to scmp.com where you can hear more about technology, trade, culture, and society.